There's a lot of beauty out there on gray days. You just have to know where to look. And after this video, you will know the process and how to get it on your canvas. I'm Roy and we're headed down to Brown County to paint on an overcast day. Let's go. Step one, find contrast. You're gonna to wanna to find something with a bit of contrast. On a sunny day, it's easy. Every shade that the light touches has contrast if you can see a shadow. On gray days, we have to be a little more observant. You're going to wanna to find something that stands out value-wise compared to the things around it. Otherwise, you are setting yourself up to struggle needlessly. And if you're that type of person who likes to struggle for no reason, good luck. In this painting, I found a reflection that brought the value and color from the sky down into the ground plane. There was also the banks of the little creek that stood out against those darker reflections of the water, and bright white sycamore trunks against the masses of bare limbs. Typically, I will look for man-made objects on gray days, but fortunately, I didn't need one here. If you need something in a pinch, a light-colored car works well. You have the windows, wheel wells, and the drop shadow under the vehicle that makes it pop out. They are common enough and you will probably see one wherever you are. Now if you live out in the wilderness, maybe you can write off a shiny white car as a still life object. I would talk with a tax professional before doing anything hasty though. Your best bet is to stay on the lookout for something that will give you a dark and light value close to one another. Step two, give yourself a plan. You gotta sketch, even more so than I would normally give you a hard time about. When there is no strong light, it causes the light and shadow pattern to be non-existent. That is when you need to rely a little more on design. Take a sketchbook with you, grab a sharpie and a pencil. You want to be able to get more than three values in your sketch and they're going to be close together. When you are sketching, remember, nothing has to be exact. In truth, you don't want it to be. Give it as much time as you need to get close enough and that will do. You're going to have to be okay with that, especially if you're just starting out or it's cold, or you're not wearing gloves like I wasn't here. Take your pencil and roughly lay in outlines for a big shape. Once you have something, take it and crudely start shading over it. Then use the Sharpie to outline and give things weight. This is a good way to sketch on days like this. You can see in my little sketch that it has numbers on the outside edge. That comes in handy when you're using more than just a light, middle, and dark value. It helps get you started. Put thoughts into the values of big shapes and how you will move into the scene. When you don't have an object that jumps out and grabs attention, look for ways to point in that direction you want people to look. Spend time thinking about how things fit together when things get subtle. I like to keep my painting filled with strong shapes that lock into each other on these type of days. With the values being close, look for ways to push them slightly in one direction or another. Create subtle gradients within those larger masses. Step three, establish the value pattern. You want to have a large value pattern to work with fairly quickly. That means massing things in and being as accurate as you can. On a gray day, the large shapes won't get obliterated by the light and shadow pattern, but you can use your knowledge of form to help you create variety within them. Think of each mass as having its own family value. When you are thinking about plane changes within the mass, such as what is facing up to the sides, down, they should all stay close to each other. You have to play around and see how far you would like to take this idea, but keep it with you for a while and try it on. You can start with that initial value and work out from the middle, but don't push too far too fast. It will break down that initial shape and things won't read as a whole. One thing that makes gray days hard to paint is that everything blends together and you want to mimic that, but in a controlled way. You want to wait until everything is fixed in a position and it reads well, before you start putting in values that pop out within the larger masses. You can see here with this background sycamore that I got ahead of myself. I hadn't established all the big plane changes that were needed before throwing in that value that broke from the pattern. It didn't sit within the scene and I had to wipe it out. It was a wiper. Step four, create unity out of multiplicity. What does that mean in this instance, and how do you use it in your work? Well, it's fairly straightforward. It's how you get all these disparate parts to make a whole. 
There are many ways to do it. Sometimes artists like to blend edges so much that they basically disappear. It creates a seamless vision through multiple areas of the painting and it just allows you to pass through everything. Other times they will use a certain repeating element, like lines, shapes, textures, colors, i.e. like a master color or whatever you would give the name for like a puddle of color that you mix into everything. Then there's the idea I'm using in this painting and I use it often, although it seems to work particularly well on gray days because of the aforementioned tendency of things always blending together on gray days. Here we are taking the edge of shapes and carving into one another. One shape begets another by this process. It means there's a relationship amongst the larger masses that is informed by their neighboring shapes. They become bound together like a weaving. And if one of your goals is to show depth, this integrates the shape into its proper place within the space of your image. You can see this happen in a couple places on the image. With the small foreground tree in front of the large pine on the top left, the dark verticals of the sycamore come out of the midground and integrate into the background, and the background hills carve into the far right trees and go behind them, placing them in the midground as well. There was also an initial flick of the brush that added a light texture into the painting. It mostly got covered over, but elements like that go a long way in unifying the whole picture. Artists will use this a lot, and earlier when I was talking about using repeating elements like lines, shapes, textures, that's something along those lines. Had I decided not to go out and paint on a recent gray day, I wouldn't have gotten to paint with my friend Steve. Now, I was struggling with figuring out how to get my year planned out. Steve is organized and he has a great deal of responsibilities that he carries with him that not many people do. His attitude's always aimed up and he gave me some great advice. Now, the question and the person matched up perfectly. Looking back, it was exactly what I needed to hear, and it was an absolute blessing. It changed the course that an entire year could take, and the course of a year certainly has implications on the rest of your life. With that being said, gray days can be difficult subject matter to paint. It can be hard without a plan, and the struggle is made more burdensome with no light to move towards. With these ideas, I hope you can go out and find the beauty under those conditions, because it is certainly there, and I've seen beautiful paintings done, and I've had wonderful moments that confirm it. Step five, know when to stop. When you're painting something that has a lot of condensed values, it is possible to quickly get that initial big read correct, which can be a bit of a problem. What do you do once you have it? Well, that's something you need to be careful about. With everything so close in value, it's easy to go straight for details and not stop until you have rendered the whole thing an absolute mess. I'm guilty of this, and it's something that a lot of artists struggle with. Being aware of it will help you pump the brakes before you naturally would want to. Which is typically when you step back from the canvas and think, oh no, what happened? It was going so well. After watching back the video, these foreground shrubs are something I should have stopped messing with beforehand. Now, you can always take things back into the studio afterwards and fix them up, but wouldn't it be nice if you could train yourself to stop at the proper moment? This is the step that I'm currently working on myself. The best thing for it is to be able to step back and continue to take in your painting from afar. I was standing on top of this one, plus it was a rickety old bridge and I didn't really trust it. And had I went back, I would have went right over the rail in the other direction. With the alternative considered, I'll chalk it up as a win on this one. Remember these things when you're out there painting on a gray day. Find the contrast, give yourself a plan, establish a value pattern, create unity, and know when to stop. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to look at them in the comments. Now, if lighting seems to be a big problem for you, I have this video right here. Grab a reference image, and I'm going to show you how to change the lighting. Hope this helps. Go out and paint and don't let the gray skies deter you.